On this episode of In the Fight, we meet soldiers living with the daily threat of rocket attacks on the Afghan-Pakistan border. U.S. forces consult the Iraqi military as they continue to draw down in Iraq. Afghan security forces take part in a rigorous four-month-long training program. Marines begin using alternative energy to power the battlefield. And a service member takes it upon himself to help a child. Sense in the fight. U.S. soldiers stationed on the Afghan border with Pakistan are continuously on the receiving end of rocket attacks. NATO Channel correspondent Mel Preen shows us what life is like for those living on forward operating base Tillman. Paktika province on the border with Pakistan is one of the main hubs for the Haqqani insurgent network. Pakistan was recently accused of supporting this group to attack American targets inside Afghanistan, something the country strongly denies. What's clear, though, is that insurgents, whether aided by the authorities or not, do operate from inside this often lawless area of Pakistan. Four kilometers from the border lies an American base known as Fob Tillman. One of the soldiers caught a rocket attack on camera while filming his pet lizard. Oh, here coming! Coming! Call it! The rocket just missed the base, nearly hitting an Afghan compound. We get rockets from over the border. We also get rockets from very close to the border. Um, and there are a great many inferences that you can draw from that. This footage, taken on the day of that attack, shows rockets being fired from a site referred to as OP-4, an area where the Americans used to have a presence, but the previous unit was spread so thinly, they pulled out. It's one kilometer from the Pakistan border. The return fire creates a secondary explosion, likely a direct hit on an arsenal of weapons. Total count for that day was 16 rockets, twice beating the daily record for this base. Well, usually when uh, something like that happens, it's to cover up for something else or to get our attention someplace else so that they can do anything from resupplying other rocket positions to moving people from one place to another. Since we have different assets that can sort of observe our surroundings in our area, they try to get us looking in one direction so we don't notice something happening in another. Fob Tillman was built just after the fall of the Taliban. It was strategically placed to disrupt insurgent activity. Fob Tillman sits on one of the easiest ways from North Waziristan, Pakistan, into the interior of Paktika province. Because we are here, it causes the insurgents to have to move around us. It causes them to have to find little trails through the mountains uh, to carry what they want to bring into Afghanistan on the backs of donkeys as opposed to in the backs of trucks. In the distance is a Pakistan checkpoint. Americans, Afghans and Pakistanis work together in centers along the border, sharing intelligence on insurgents. The recent finger pointing at Pakistan hasn't been good for office relations. You know, I think when you get to the ground level where you're looking across the border at the uh, Afghan and Pakistan forces facing each other, trying to cooperate and attack the, the enemy, which is the insurgency, then that kind of public bantering back and forth makes it difficult for us because it creates a, a sense of, you know, well, can I trust these guys? Or are they really trying to help us out? The soldiers don't get too involved in the politics. They're too busy planning operations to take out the enemy who's firing at them. Mel Preen in Paktika, Afghanistan, for the NATO Channel. The 82nd Airborne Division's Anbar Police Directorate Stability Team is all about helping Iraqi security learn how to make Iraq a safer place. 
Army Sergeant Tony McCaslin sits down with the 2nd Advise and Assist Brigade's Major William White to find out how smooth the transition will be. This is Anvil 4. I'm over at the APD over. In 2004, Major William White was flying Blackhawks over Iraq. Coming out here to Anbar was uh, something you did at night and did very carefully and very deliberately to make sure that uh, you stayed safe because it was a very, very dangerous area. In recent years, Anbar has become one of the safest provinces in Iraq. Now, he lives in Ramadi, the capital of Anbar, so that he can best carry out the 2nd Brigade, 82nd Airborne Division's new mission. We're consultants for their security forces. You know, we, have, uh, we, have that, we have that great pool of experience and we apply that to their, to their systems. Major White is a part of the Brigade's Stability Transition Team, whose mission focuses on advising the higher echelons of the AMBAR Police Directorate and provincial government officials. The STT's job is to go out and advise these senior Iraqi officers on how to work through their own systems to become a functioning, capable organization that can sustain itself after the U.S. withdrawal. Their day-to-day -day schedule may involve anything from meeting with local leaders, scheduling classes, or even sharing meals. The key thing is that we learn their system and we try to help them work through their systems to be more effective. As U.S. forces transition out of Iraq, it's important that the Iraqi leadership is able to work smoothly within their new democratic government as opposed to the previous dictatorship. They're realizing that it's, it's my future, so I'm gonna go out and make it what I think it ought to be. So they have that, they have that understanding. Um, they're, they have motivation, they have the initiative, they have the drive. They may not have all the tools, they don't quite know how, they don't have the experience to do it, they don't have the rank to make the big changes, but they want the changes and they want to work hard for it. It's the AMBAR Police Director at STT's aim to teach the governmental and police leaders how to find those tools, work within their systems, and streamline the entire process. Yeah, I think they will. I think they'll be able to push through it, but I think it won't be without any, uh, I, won't be, I don't think it'll be free of trepidation and fear and uh, a lot of uncertainty. It's the future, it's unknown. I do think it will be stronger because it will be theirs. So my thoughts are, I have hope for him. I do, I, I have hope for him. Army Sergeant Tony McCaslin, Arumadi, Iraq. Hi, this is Major Crayonta West. I'm at Camp Air John Kuwait. I would love to give a happy Thanksgiving to my family up at Sumter, South Carolina. Uh, Michael West, Milton West, and Iona Beasley, thank you for your love and support and all that you're doing for me while I'm here. Have a happy Thanksgiving, and I'll see you when I get home. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Lauren Hewlin, deployed to Southwest Asia. Just want to give a shout out to my mom, Ida Hewlin, in Frederick, Maryland. I love you, Mom. Happy Veterans Day. Hi, Captain Phil Fowler from in Baghdad, Iraq. I'm from Wilmington, Delaware. I just want to say hi to my great family. Uh, Lynn, my wife, and my five kids, Phoebe, Henry, Hope, Lydia, and Gus. I love you. Coming up, we go inside one of Muammar Gaddafi's political prisons. And Afghan security forces take part in a rigorous four-month-long training program. Check out DividsHub.net for the latest accurate and reliable information as In the Fight continues. What does the acronym MASH stand for? The answer when we return. I want to give a shout out to my family and friends. I want to send a shout out to my husband. To my parents, my family back home. I'd like to give a shout out to my girlfriend. To my family and friends in Lansing, Michigan. To my family out in Tucson, Arizona. To my beautiful wife and children in Des Moines, Iowa. To everybody in Texas. In York, Pennsylvania. Colorado Springs, Colorado. Chicago, Illinois. Harrisburg, Virginia. Orlando, Florida. Oceanside, California. And Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. I love you guys, I miss you, and I hope I'll see you soon. With the new Military 24-7 app from Divots, you turn your favorite mobile device into a window to the front lines. Connect with your nation's finest men and women through our video and photography archives and stay up to date with news reported directly from service members. Quickly share information and breaking stories with friends via Facebook, Twitter, or email. News, photos, video, your military 24-7.
what does the acronym MASH stand for? The answer is C, Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. With Libya under the control of rebel fighters, many of Gaddafi's crimes against humanity are now coming to light. NATO Channel correspondent William Bonnet takes us inside one of Gaddafi's political prisons with some of its past inmates and brings us this story. Mondir is only 18 years old. He was detained here in Ain Zara prison for nearly three months, suffering the kind of arbitrary detention and torture that is one of the many reasons why the UN called on NATO to intervene and protect the civilian population of Libya. <laughs> The men here were all arrested, detained and tortured for various reasons inciting opposition demonstrations, having their phone calls tapped when they were criticizing the regime, or writing anti-Gaddafi slogans on walls. Adil here was arrested and detained for giving bread to revolutionary fighters. His wife knew he had been arrested, however was kept in the dark about what was to happen to him. <laughs> This was often the case, men arrested and detained with no knowledge of where they were being held or for how long. People knew these places, known as political prisons, existed, but knew nothing about what went on inside them. It's claimed some men were even killed here. Others were said to have been released but never seen again. These men see surviving such a place where they could have been killed as a great accomplishment and something that they endured for their country. Despite the torture he's suffered at the hands of his captors, Mohammed doesn't seek revenge. Now, with the gates open, there are no guards to be fearful of. Previous inmates can walk around freely, showing their families where they were being held and how they lived. This is the NATO channel reporting from Tripoli. The continuous training of Afghan forces is vital to the security of Afghanistan. Air Force Tech Sergeant Shane Cronin takes us to a rigorous four-month training course to see what progress is being made and files this report. Bucket! What? Yeah. Members of the 3rd Kandak, 5th Brigade, demonstrate new capabilities. This particular Kandak is part of the Afghan National Civil Order Police, or ANCOP. They are the first to train under an extended four-month program, four times the duration they previously received during pre-deployment. These recruits are highly motivated for a good reason. We had like 30 years war in the past. This is the time to, you know, we, we came in and fix, fix all the problems and improve our country uh, to have a very good life and safe life for our people. Members of the 3rd Battalion, 6 Marines, out of Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, provide day-to-day -day mentorship on live fire marksmanship, quick reaction force techniques, and emergency medical training. Overall, uh, the people uh, have confidence in the ANCOP, and uh, our training here, although we very much focus on the basics, allows them to grow and develop their own uh, abilities to, to really operate as the paramilitary force that they are. The 3-5 Brigade will deploy this October and employ these new skills in an effort to make Afghanistan a safer place for everyone. Tech Sergeant Shane Cronin, Kabul, Afghanistan. 
Improvised explosive devices are still the weapon of choice for insurgents throughout Afghanistan. As a result, basic materials that are easy ingredients for homemade explosives are banned throughout the country. Army Staff Sergeant Walter Talens shows us what happens to these materials once they've been confiscated. HME, or homemade explosive, is the primary material used by insurgents in Afghanistan for roadside bombs. The two units from Fort Carson, Colorado, are loading an estimated 2,000 pounds of ammonium nitrate collected by the Afghan National Police on various occasions. In 1995, 4,000 pounds of ammonium nitrate was used in the Oklahoma City bombing. Specialist Jacob Gaultier of 749th EOD explains how the Afghan government ban on ammonium nitrate is affecting insurgent operations. They have to make their own HME now instead of just buying this at a farming store or somewhere where you get you know, fertilizer and just grounding it down. That's, I mean, that's how easy it was. Now they're having to switch to making their own. So it's really helping out. Once the truck was loaded, the convoy moved to a safe area, away from civilians for the controlled explosion. EOD team leader from Washington, North Carolina, Sergeant First Class Charles Deans, explained what will happen next. Because we can't carry enough explosive to get rid of the amount that we have today, we're actually trying to blow it into the air to spread it out because it's a fertilizer. Um, and we picked this spot in between the mountains so that the, the mountains can channel the blast wave up and away from, from any homes or uh, fobs in the area. Sergeant Deans continues to explain the benefits of destroying the fertilizer. Here in the next year or so after the rainy season, this will probably be uh, one of the greenest areas in Afghanistan for, for a couple of months. Um, so yeah, it's pretty good for the environment, it doesn't hurt anything. After placing the explosive charges with the fertilizer, the soldiers moved to a safe distance to view their work. Hey, EOD, this is Red Four. You're clear to blow when you're ready. Reporting for the 319 Mobile Public Affairs Detachment outside of Kandahar City, Afghanistan. Fire in the hole, fire in the hole, fire in the hole. I'm U.S. Army Staff Sergeant Walter Talents. brothers and sisters, nephews and nieces in Seattle, Washington. Hi, my name's Hospital Corpsman Elizabeth Armstrong, Dakota Barre with ESA Medical Expeditionary Clinic. I wanted to say hello to my beautiful daughters, Leah and Jamie. I miss you very mucho. Thank you, Tia and Theo, for taking care of them while I'm gone. And I can't wait to come home. Hello, this is Major Larry Heslop with US Arsent in Camp Arif John, Kuwait. I want to say hello to all my family in Kansas City, especially my son, Lair. Uh, stay focused, do well, and uh, we'll see you soon when I get home. Coming up, Marines begin using alternative energy to power the battlefield. And we'll showcase some of the best photos from our service members as In the Fight, presented by Divids, continues. Alfred Nobel, the founder of the Nobel Prize, is also known for which invention? The answer when we return. With the new Military 24-7 app from Divids, you turn your favorite mobile device into a window to the front lines. Connect with your nation's finest men and women through our video and photography archives and stay up to date with news reported directly from service members. Quickly share information and breaking stories with friends via Facebook, Twitter, or email. News, photos, video, your military 24-7.
Alfred Nobel, the founder of the Nobel Prize, is also known for which invention? The answer is D, dynamite. By 2025, the Marine Corps must use 50% less fuel on the battlefield than it does today. Marine Staff Sergeant Jeremy Ross reports from the Helmand Province, where the Marines' latest technologies are powering the front lines. Many Marine Corps bases in Helmand Province run on fossil fuel, a lot of it. In August, the Corps used more than 219,000 gallons in the province, but here at Patrol Base Boldak, Marines are taking advantage of a resource that is abundant in the Afghan desert, the sun. What we have here is the green system. You can see the solar panels up here on top of the HESCO barrier. PB Boldak is home to the latest in the Corps' pursuit of efficient and alternative energy, carried out through a process known as the Experimental Forward Operating Base, or XFOB. And it's essentially our way of seeing what commercial off-the-shelf type technologies that focus on energy efficiency and alternative power can make a difference for us here on the battlefield and throughout the Marine Corps' mission. The technologies at PB Boldak are in line with the Expeditionary Energy Strategy. Signed in March by Commandant General James Amos, the strategy directs that by 2025, the Marine Corps will use 50% less fuel than it does on the battlefield today. Now to do that, we have to do demand reduction, we have to train our Marines in, in valuing energy and fuel properly as an asset. And then we also have to provide them with capabilities that, that are much more efficient. The idea behind all of these programs is to help an energy dependent force be more self-sustaining. We talk about getting back to the roots of, of expeditionary, which means fast, lethal, and austere. And all, so all the capabilities that we're pursuing are in that mindset. It is to enhance the mission capability of the Marine Corps, not just for a reduction of fuel or a reduction of cost, but is it can we make the Marine Corps a better fighting force for its true mission and its mission out here in Afghanistan uh, by pursuing these capabilities. Reporting from Helmand Province, I'm Staff Sergeant Jeremy Ross. For those who are injured on the battlefield and need special medical attention, Air transport is sometimes the only way to get servicemen and women to the care that they need. Air Force Staff Sergeant Peter Ising files this report. Arriving at their C-130, the 386th Expeditionary Aeromedical Evacuation Flight begins adapting the aircraft for patients. The medics transform the aircraft into a hospital with wings. Their mission is to fly into hostile areas picking up wounded warriors and flying them back to a medical center that offers increased medical services. Flight nurse Lieutenant William Sykes says the less missions he has, the better. So today we flew a scheduled bandage mission. Uh, we just took off, we flew in the local area. And it's something we do about three times a week. We'll go through and pick up patients at various spots. Usually we have about four to seven stops. It just depends on the day. Uh, today was kind of a light load. We had two, which is a good thing. If we're not flying a whole lot, it's always a good thing. And these people aren't getting hurt. Lieutenant Sykes also said it's rewarding to take the injured troops and get them out of the theater, knowing that their quality of life is about to get better. Getting a wounded warrior back to a place that can provide them better help is the ultimate goal for the airmen of the 386th Expeditionary Aeromedical Evacuation Flight. Reporting from Southwest Asia, I'm Staff Sergeant Peter Ising. As U.S. forces get to know the communities they patrol, they sometimes come across a situation that requires special attention. Petty Officer Brandon Shelander shows us how one service member took it upon himself to get a little boy the care that he desperately needed. Muslam was born with his bladder outside of his body, a birth defect that could have killed him. If it weren't for the intervention of a U.S. Army Civil Affairs officer, Major Glenn Batchinger, there's miracle upon miracle in this story. That, that I happened to be on a patrol in Jalalabad City the day that he was there with his mother. Uh, his mother exposed him to me. I saw this horrendous birth defect, and I knew that I couldn't walk away from this problem, that I had to try to help this child. And so he arranged for Muslim to receive corrective surgery in New Jersey. Now, 11 months later, a very happy and healed Muslim is back at home. It was great. I promised them that we would bring his son, their son home and we were able to deliver. Muslam's father, Hakik Shah, 
says he's overjoyed to see his son in such good health. And, uh, he was in a very bad condition. Then once I contact with the American, they took to America and treated him. And now uh, I'm very happy. To celebrate the occasion, the governor of Nangarhar, Gulaga Shurzai, invited the boy and his family to a special press conference to showcase what can be accomplished when the U.S. and Afghanistan work together. Petty Officer Brandon Shelander, Jalalabad, Afghanistan. Divids is a 24-7 operation that provides a timely, accurate, and reliable connection between the media and the military serving worldwide. Through a network of over 200 portable satellite transmitters around the globe and a distribution hub in Atlanta, Georgia, Divids gives you access to the front lines with live and archived broadcast video, still imagery, and print products. Visit our website at dividshub.net and search through our enormous video and photo library. Register on our website to gain complete access to high-definition content, along with breaking news alerts and webcasts from top military officials. For questions or comments about In the Fight or Divids, you can email us at ondemand at dividshub.net or follow us on Twitter and Facebook. As we close, we feature some of the best photos that Divids has to offer as we listen to Eddie Horst's composition, Pangea. See you next time, In the Fight. <laughs>